how is it that within this field of consciousness that we're all part of, we find a you that has an individual perspective that feels separate from everything else. What if this question could be discovered using math? Andres Gomez Emelson is the founder of Qualia Research Institute, where they seek to develop a mathematical formalization for subjective experience and its emotional valence to map the state space of consciousness. Said another way, his lab is focusing on discovering the math behind our current experience. You can, in some way, find a mathematical model such that your experience right now is a configuration of that model in such a way that by analyzing the mathematical features of that mathematical model, you will infer things such as, are you feeling cold? Are you feeling warm? Time is moving really fast and, and things like that. By understanding the math and geometry behind subjective experience, we may understand how to create a more supportive and enjoyable one. A very, 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 very key feature <laughs> that makes an experience feel good is coherence and phase locking between coupled oscillators <laughs> in your nervous system. The most extreme versions of this are the jhanas and uh, some drugs like uh, 5-MeO-DMT, which generate kind of like these states of hypercoherence across many different frequencies. And, and there's many pieces of evidence I could provide kind of like for arguing for, for this perspective, both, you know, neurological as well as phenomenological. But it really, really does seem that like really peak experiences, like the most beautiful, mystical, mind-blowing experiences tend to involve extreme levels of coherence such that waves can travel in a very linear way without resistance. So you feel kind of this like very clean resonant chamber without distortions, without uh, imperfections or defects. Understanding the math of consciousness may also help us understand why we suffer and what we can do about it. You may not notice that like your energy channels are actually in a geometrically frustrated state. There are regions of your energy body that are like pointing in the same direction. But then on ayahuasca, you pump your system full of energy and all of those little conflicting regions become highlighted because there's just too much energy. It's going to go through all of the paths. And it just turns out some of those paths are actually like in internal conflict with each other. Whereas, yeah, something like, like yoga actually kind of like might minimize that. Like it's, it's all about like, yeah, le making the energy flow regular and smooth. To finish this conversation, Andre shares his thoughts on our future, including the state of AI. I'm fairly confident that, yeah, current hardware cannot be conscious. Before we get into this conversation, I wanna ask you to join this amazing community of consciousness explorers. This whole idea of pursuing expanded consciousness and the boundaries of human potential while living a modern life is relatively new, which is why we interview revered masters, teachers, experts, and practitioners to help you on your own journey. To stay up to date on the latest conversations, simply click subscribe below and you'll be notified each time a new episode comes out. I am so grateful for all of your support and comments. I love reading them. Now let's dive into this conversation. Andres, what's up, man? Hi, <laughs> thank you for uh, having me, uh, Scott. <laughs> I'm very excited to have you. I've been following Qualia for a long time. And, you know, it's it's funny. A lot of people have probably been on the contemplative, spiritual, consciousness exploration path and might not have even heard of that word before. So maybe as a, maybe as a starting point, what does Qualia mean? Yeah, no, I mean, it's um, my favorite word um, because it really refers to something I think it's so important and so overlooked. Uh, the easiest way I have found to describe what the word means is to remind people if, uh, you know, when they were kids, uh, they ever wondered, is the blue that I see the same blue that other people see? Uh, and this is kind of a challenging question, right? Because imagine that like the mapping between, you know, um, frequencies of light, to the feeling of the color that you experienced was different? Would you be able to, you know, figure that out with conversation? Not necessarily, right? Because all that you can really say in order to distinguish a color from another is just what is the relationship it has to other colors. And, you know, if the network of relationship between colors has some symmetries, <laughs> then actually it uh, might be impossible to actually tell, like, are we seeing the same blue 
um, the, the, the both of us. And, um, but qualia is a much more general term. So, so the blueness of blue would be a particular quail, you know, an individual um, kind of like facet or quality of experience. But, uh, you know, smells, uh, tactile sensations, the way thoughts feel, not the sensory input that triggers it, but rather the way in which it presents itself within your experience. So that, that is qualia. <laughs> so the Qualia Research in Institute essentially investigates uh, properties of qualia. You know, what is the network of relationships between qualia? Uh, what is the space of possible qualia? The ways in which they can be put together uh, and create experiences? What makes qualia feel good or bad? So all, all of those is kind of um, topics are within the purview of uh, our research paradigms. I appreciate that explanation. So it's, I guess, kind of one way to think about it is, is qualia creates their subjective experience. Yeah, it's, I, I would even say something like qualia is the paint of our subjective experience. The, the, nice. the thing with which our experience gets painted with. <laughs> I, I love the metaphor. And, you know, one thing I've heard you talk about in other interviews that I thought was very interesting is this notion that people have a shape of consciousness. Yes. What do you mean by that? Absolutely. This is a super important concept. Um, I've been thinking a lot of, about it for a long time, but um, uh, the person who kind of like formalized that way of thinking was um, co-founder uh, Mike Johnson. He wrote a, an amazing book called Principia Qualia uh, in 2015. I recommend reading it. It's really good philosophy. And um, he defines this concept of qualia formalism. So qualia formalism is, um, okay, not only is qualia real, you know, is the paint of our subjective experience, uh, but more so for any, you know, given system that is generating an experience, what Quilia formalism says is that there will correspond a mathematical object such that the features of that object are map onto or isomorphic to the features of our experience. Um, in other words, that you can in some way uh, find a mathematical model such that your experience right now is a configuration of that model in such a way that by analyzing the mathematical features of that mathematical model, you will infer things such as, are you feeling cold? Are you feeling warm? You know, <laughs> do you feel like time is moving really fast? And, and things like that. Um, and um, more concretely, you know, like applied to kind of like one of the areas that we are really interested in, kind of like if you zoom in within Quilia formalism, then we have valence structuralism, which is the idea that what makes an experience feel good or bad is one of those features, is one of those kind of mathematical structures within an experience. So, so basically, someone could look at their equation and understand more about their experience than perhaps they do today. Correct. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you would probably figure out things about your experience that you're not even able to attend to, but they're actually real and are modifying your experience. But it's uh, something that you can really only kind of like infer <laughs> with one of these methods. So I guess like a, a, a kind of key question that I have here is like, what have we, what is, what have you learned about from a mathematical perspective or from a scientific perspective, what makes for a high quality experience, you know, a high quality subjective experience of consciousness? Yeah, 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 absolutely. So there are various ways of answering this. And I would say what we focus on at QRI is the most kind of like fundamental way of tackling this question, which is really, okay, like what features of experience make, you know, make, make the experience feel good or bad, um, which is, I should, you know, as a preamble, it's just such a different way of thinking about the problem. Uh, because when people think about, okay, what makes for a happy experience, they think of external conditions, right? Like they think of, you know, it's very true, you know, like the five, you know, most important things, which are like, um, you know, diet, exercise, uh, sleep, um, uh, so social interactions and, and stress levels. Um, well, and then you can add also air quality and okay, there you got like, okay, six factors that 
predict very, very highly your level of well-being. But those are kind of like very indirect, right? Like those are modulating internal systems, but then the actual feeling of happiness, the actual feeling of joy is a configuration inside. Um, in neuroscience, they might focus on, for example, mainstream neuroscience, they might focus on neurotransmitter systems. They might say something like, Oh, like dopamine, serotonin concentrations, uh, endogenous opiate concentrations, you know, th that's kind of like what modulates happiness, the fundamental nature of happiness. Um, or they might say something like, oh, no, it's, uh, it has to do with functional localization. There is such a thing as the pleasure centers. And when you modulate the pleasure centers, that is what gives rise to, you know, joy and happiness. Uh, but as far as we, you know, read that literature uh, at QRI, we, we make sense of it as, hey, these are correlates. You know, these are things that are highly correlated with positive mood, but they're not themselves positive mood. You know, they're things that are mediating or conditioning it. So what we have learned is that a very, 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 very key feature <laughs> that makes an experience feel good is coherence and phase locking between coupled oscillators <laughs> in your nervous system. Um, the most extreme versions of this are the jhanas and uh, some drugs like uh, 5-MeO-DMT, which generate kind of like these states of hypercoherence across many different frequencies. And, and there's many pieces of evidence I could provide kind of like for arguing for, for this perspective, both, you know, neurological as well as phenomenological. Um, but it really, really does seem that like really peak experiences, like the most beautiful, mystical, mind-blowing experiences tend to involve extreme levels of coherence such that waves can travel in a very linear way without resistance. So you feel kind of this like very clean resonant chamber without distortions, without uh, imperfections mm. or defects. It's just like very smooth geometry. That's usually what feels very good. <laughs> And, and can you, for people that maybe aren't familiar with the term coherence, like, can you yes. share like how that expresses in our system? Yes. Yes. So here's a metaphor that I have heard, which is a pretty good one, which is like, you know, like those, um, uh, yeah. Imagine there's like a fire in a village where right? like, and you're trying to extinguish, um, uh, the fire of a house. So you form kind of this line of people, um, where they, go, I don't know, from the lake and they take, everybody has like a, um, uh, a bucket, right? And they take water from the lake and they pass the water they have in their bucket to the guy next door. <laughs> so uh, for the water to travel properly, right? Like from the lake to the fire, people need to be coordinated, right? So that like when they put the bucket of water to the left, the water arrives and they are prepared to pass on the water to the next one. So to be incoherence or phase locked means that when you pass on the water, the other person is precisely ready to re receive it. So there's like a, a perfect match. There's kind of no, no friction, no spikes. It isn't the case that you drop the water or that the water gets concentrated and spills over, but like the water just flows smoothly. So that, that would be a state of coherence. And I, and I guess the million dollar question is, is, is what have you learned about making it easier for our default state to be coherent. Yeah. Yes. Uh, this is the paradigm that we developed. Um, originally came up with the idea. Mike and I developed it for several years, and then we've kept developing much further, which is the concept of neural annealing. Uh, the latest iteration of this is neural field annealing. Uh, quite a technical uh, theory. Uh, I'm happy to kind of provide some of the outlines, um, like the the core concepts of it. Um, essentially, what you need to do <laughs> is figure out ways to um, energize your system in a very clean and consonant way in order to kick you out of a dissonant attractor and then cool slowly in such a way that you maximize the chances for this phase locking to happen. I mean, essentially what you want to do is break up kind of like the... Uh, dysfunctional, kind of like overused little patterns that are causing dissonance or topological defects in the field, which happen early on during the energization process. And then you want to cool down slowly with mindfulness and positive mood, such that you get like the interlocking effect as you cool down. Um, and essentially, this general pattern applies to essentially 
pretty much any, you know, transformative <laughs> technique that we have looked at, and it, and it generalizes, right? So this explains, for example, uh, you know, conceptually at least, that's what's going on with saunas, what's going on with high intensity interval training, with breath work, with psychedelics, meditation, yoga. Um, all of these are kind of like techniques that inject fairly neutral energy. You know, like the point is not kind of like, I don't know, not, not something like very semantic, you know, it's not like a loaded type of energy. It's not like, um, energy with an emotion. It's just pure energy. <laughs> and th that is like the, the best for, for these sort of practices. Like you, you, you want to lean into that so that then you can get this uh, process, uh, started. And, uh, Jana practice is very much like that. I mean, um, there's many ways to achieve these meditation states. Um, but all of them involve in some way kind of energizing, breaking up patterns, and then recohering. Yeah. It, so, you know, I think a lot of these practices, you hear the term kind of like activating practices, right? Like breath work, mm. meditation, you're activating energy. Some people may not be familiar with that. And then what is, and then you mentioned followed by the slowdown. Could you describe yeah. that kind of more specifically? Because I, yeah. I just, just to share, like a lot of people think, okay, well, isn't my meditation my calm down? You know what I mean? They're they're maybe not thinking yeah. about it from like a nervous system perspective. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, meditation, of course, is a large cluster of practices. There are meditation techniques that are, for example, just to calm down, or like just to lower arousal, feel very relaxed. If you do those practices, you will also see, you know, important transformations. Um, and I would actually argue that it's also through an annealing process, but it's a little bit more, more subtle to explain how. However, usually kind of like the most effective kind of quick methods of advancing meditation is when you practice several techniques that take into account like several parts of this process. So you have like a way of generating energy, a way of focusing on positive mood, and then a way of calming down. Um, and uh, yeah, jhana practice is, is kind of like that. Like for example, one method that um, uh, we've developed, uh, you, there's a playlist on YouTube called uh, Meta Annealing uh, that does this practice just as, a, <laughs> as an example. You start out with uh, breath work, um, like 10 minutes of something like a Wim Hof uh, breathing uh, exercise, which is really arousing, right? Like, like that raises your energy a lot. Um, then you move on to like a period of like really positive mood, which is uh, loving kindness meditation. So like while you're energized, you tune into that positive mood, then that positive mood will provide the harmony and the coherence. And then you switch on to very relaxing music that will kind of crystallize that coherence. Um, I, I will say though, that there are definitely like Buddhist, um, uh, uh, branches, for example, that just focus on relaxation. Um, mm. and it turns out that, yeah, you know, over a longer period of time, but, but yeah, pure relaxation also takes it to kind of these like very clean levels of harmony, but it, uh, yeah, it's not as spectacular and it's not as, uh, ecstatic <laughs> and, and it takes longer. Yeah. The jhana meditations are definitely very special. We've had Steven from Journey on the show. And um, awesome. I know a lot of people got really turned on to the, to the Johnas after that. Um, <laughs> you, you know, the other the other organization I've heard talk a lot about coherence is HeartMath. Mm. And they kind of approach it from a more heart-mind coherence, which yeah. I guess is slightly different than what we're talking about. Well, it is part of the picture. So... I mean, I guess like what distinguishes QRI, one of the things that distinguishes QRI, right, is like this attempt at getting kind of like really formalizing philosophy, right, and like mathematizing it and getting to the absolute core of it, right? Like, okay, like what kind of mathematical object corresponds to consciousness? Um, you know, hard math, of course, like I, I, I think it's uh, really fascinating what they're doing. You know, they're correlating things such as, okay, like EEG coherence and heart, heart uh, coherence and the coherence between those two systems. And they show things such as like, okay, like that seems to be related with a, a sense of connection or the feeling of empathy. Uh, for me, that's valuable information. There's like valuable clues, but you still have to put it in some kind of conceptual framework to tie it all together. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we're yeah currently talking to um, yeah various academics who actually are like focusing precisely on 
uh, quantifying like coherence in various peripheral nervous system uh, systems and uh, the central nervous system and seeing how that modulates things such as the subjective feeling of stress and the subjective feeling of calm, uh, well-being. And, you know, there's a lot of a lot of findings in this area that uh, I don't think I'm supposed to talk about yet, uh, about some of them, but, but, but part of the idea is that, yes, you know. Let like, us know, spill the beans. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, like, so, so there's definitely a lot to say about, um, okay, so if, if this, is, this is really interesting. So probably you may have noticed, right, like very empathetic people in general tend to be very embodied. Like there is some kind of correlation between how much in tune somebody is with their own body and how much people can empathize with others, how much they can put themselves in other people's shoes. I don't think there's a perfect correlation. It's not obviously the same thing, but I don't know. Let's say they're correlated at 0.6 or 0.7 or something. So like what's, what, what accounts for kind of like why is embodiment and empathy related? Uh, here's what I think is happening. I mean, I think embodiment is uh, a kind of coherence between peripheral systems and the central nervous system is when you phase lock, let's say your stomach and your brain, your heart and your brain, your heart and your stomach, or those three systems are, are interlocked. Um, so that's kind of like a state of embodiment. And then more so, um, I, I strongly suspect that the way in which we model other people actually involves these peripheral uh, systems. That when you're talking to somebody, uh, you may not realize it, but actually there's like a, a model of the other person in your stomach and in your heart or kind of in the interaction between them. Um, so my, my current understanding is that for you to be in tune with other people, you have to be in tune with your models of other people. And for that, you need to be in tune with your stomach and your and your heart. So, and the moment you're actually in tune with that, then, you know, the suffering of people will affect you and the happiness of people will affect you because those are coupled with your central nervous system. So I, I do think there's, yeah, definitely something really significant there to be, to be found. How, do, how does this, this idea jibe with the concepts of like tuning into other people's energy field, having your channels open, being able to ha perceive information outside of your field, um, which seems to correlate with contemplative practice? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, my default... Uh, research paradigm here is to use this framework we call the indirect realism about perception, <laughs> which is that anything that you experience is a feature of your world simulation. Is like something that you know your your body, nervous system, electromagnetic field is generating. Uh, so by default, you know I approach this by saying, well, when you when you feel that you're getting in tune with some other, somebody else, you're actually getting in tune with a part of yourself that is modeling mm. that other person. And uh, because a lot of feelings of feeling in, you know, in tune with others are delusional, right? Like there, there's a, it's very often that you think like, oh, I made a really strong connection with this person. <laughs> and the, the other person is like, I, I barely know you, <laughs> right? Basically like, my 20s it, dating life. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, you, you, you yeah, you, you can um, delude yourself, you know, about how deep a connection is with somebody. Like it's a... Uh, it, you know, personality disorders, you know, the, 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 that, that happens a lot. So um, at the same time, though, I, I am open to like, you know, psi effects like telepathy. I think it's relatively unlikely, but there are some things that have happened in my life that make me think like, okay, like there's maybe there's something to this. Um, in which case I would default to something like, yeah, it's some kind of electromagnetic resonance effect. Um there are a lot of like weird things here that would have to be explained, such as like, why can this electromagnetic effect uh, have such a wide reach? Because, you know, the, the amplitude of a signal drops with one over R square, where R is like the, the distance, right? So you being able to send somebody that something that happens in another country should be really, really, really difficult, right? Because like that signal is almost completely lost in noise. But uh, yeah, I mean, people who do a lot of <laughs> contemplative practices develop powers, so to speak, they will say like, yeah, I can <laughs> remote view in France or something. So, okay, something else is happening. The, the one kind of like data point that I do think that there's probably something there um, is probably like being able to sense when a family member dies, just because that's very well documented and like 
I just know a lot of people for whom that happened and it happened to me. Like it's, it's just something like, okay, like if there's something weird in this world <laughs> that I can't really explain, nothing like that, I would point, point, point to that. Um, but by and large, you know, for most of our research, we're just make the assumption that, yeah, these are like internal systems. And what's happening is that mm. you're modulating the internal coherence between different components of yourself. Interesting. So your perspective doesn't, does or does not, like this perspective that you use at QRI, does or does not consider this notion of a unified field that we exist within? Oh, it does. I mean, but but that doesn't entail um, that the sense of connection is necessarily real. So th these are like not... Um, mm. Uh, incompatible. So yes. So right. in our ontology, um, I mean, th these does sound very woo. I, I admit, but uh, I think you know, We're I, think, all I think we can on this show. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say, yeah, the universe is a gigantic field of consciousness. Uh, of that, I'm I'm I'm, pr I'm pretty sure. Um, and then what, ma what, what we makes are, you so sure? I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's ruling out uh, other possibilities essentially, like. Um, like rolling out the possibility that consciousness emerges at a certain level. It's, it's a long conversation, but, uh, I mean, essentially there's kind of like two options, like either consciousness emerges at some level or consciousness is found all the way down. Um, and, uh, after a lot of pondering and writing essays, I, I, I have inferred or like I have arrived at the conclusion that consciousness cannot emerge at a certain level. So it has to be at the base level <laughs> and, and therefore, yeah, the universe is made of consciousness. Which honestly yeah. aligns to a lot of ancient wisdom. You know, a lot of people have said this yeah. before. You wouldn't be the first <laughs> one to come to such such realization. Yes. One one key um maybe one way in which this, you know, realization or or, or a way of seeing or theory maybe it's a little bit more formal or, or might be more scientifically compatible that let's say like um more metaphorical kind of like spiritual visions of this. Is that we also have a theory for what what is responsible for pre precisely creating the individuation? Like, how is it that within this field of consciousness that we are all part of, we find a you that has an individual perspective that feels separate from everything else? Or like you you, you kind of like still have to explain that. And yeah, in you know religious texts, um, you know mystical texts, you will find a meta metaphor or something like uh, the universe is a gigantic ocean and we are waves in the ocean. Right, so, something like that, which is a, a great metaphor. The problem is waves don't have boundaries, right? Like waves are like softly interconnected with everything, whereas your experience right now has a clear boundary, right? Like there's like a definite amount of information uh, and qualia within your experience. So, so we want something more concrete than a wave. Uh, somebody talk, some people talk about like eddies, um, but we talk about topological pockets which is like a, a, a formalized version of, of this, where like, no, actually the, the field lines wrap around and create loops. And when you have that, then you actually do have an objective boundary and everything inside is causally separated from everything outside. And we think like that's, that's what creates individuality. I hope you're enjoying this conversation so far. If you like what you hear, let me know by clicking like, subscribing to the channel, and responding with a comment around something that you found interesting in the conversation so far. In addition to these videos, I do a lot of writing on the exploration of consciousness and my own personal revelations in my newsletter called Consciousness, the Doorway to Human Evolution. To receive these updates and more, all you need to do is simply head to the link in the description below and you'll be added to the community of 20,000 plus consciousness explorers receiving weekly ideas and inspiration in their inbox. I look forward to hearing from you there. Now let's get back to the show. Yeah, I've heard you use this word topology before in the context of yeah. consciousness. And to be honest, I'm not 100% sure what it means. I'd love to learn more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's a, a metaphor. Um, okay, so imagine that, yeah, the, the, the surface of a balloon is kind of the field of consciousness. Uh, the question then becomes like, okay, how, how do you get like a region of that balloon to segment out so that you can say like, oh, this is me, or like, this is my experience within the field of consciousness. Um, so, you know, if you, if you kind of like uh, bend it or something, that's not enough because, you know, the, the field is still just a plane, it's still just the surface. But if you take 
two sides of the balloon and then you twist them in opposite directions, there is a precise moment where the center collapses, right? Like, and, and yeah, it's almost kind of, you get two balloons connected mm -hmm. by a point. So, so that point is a special, right? Because it's a, essentially it's a difference in degree, you know, how twisted it is. And at a certain threshold, there's a difference in kind, right? Like at, at some precise moment, it collapses and it segments. That, that is a topological change. Like where a whole bunch of points collapse into a singularity or there's some transformation that, that just changes uh, what is connected with what. And like, are, do you have one plane or do you have two planes? Do you have one sphere, two spheres, uh, one hole, two holes, three holes? That, that is like what topology modulates. Um, and I mean, think about it, right? If you have two, two balloons connected by a point, if you're in, in one of those balloons and you want to go to the other balloon, you will have to go through the pinch point, right? Like there's just no, no option but having to do that. Th that is what I think is happening, that if you, you want to go kind of from your experience to my experience, you will have to go through some zero-dimensional singularity that erases information <laughs> in order to go to my experience. And that's why we don't have access to each other because the information mm. collapses. They're just, um, there's a bottleneck that prevents information transmission between us. Interesting. I can't help but but wonder about, um, you know, a lot of the realized masters that I've read about where that boundary seems to dissolve. Yeah. Where they, you know, s seem to be able to know what's going on in my head, seem to be able to, you know, do lots of these things in a way that um, it, it just, it's far out. It's far out. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I've got to be honest. I haven't um, interacted with um, with like meditation masters who I got the impression they were psychic. Like, I, I guess I, or maybe that's the just the type of people I've interacted with. But but I have interacted with a good number of highly attained meditators. Um, you know, even gone on retreats with yeah people who qualify as like fourth path. Um, you know, people traditionally, you know, classically enlightened people. Um, what struck with them is just how really nice and emotionally stable they are. <laughs> and and maybe that, yeah, there, there's like a feel of like, oh, actually my neuroticism cancels mm. out a little bit when I'm around them. You know, there's like some things that just turn off and it's very pleasant <laughs> to hang out with them. Um, and they do, do, do describe like a, a permanent abiding in centerlessness, like some, some sense of like, well, I'm not inside or outside. Uh, there's no sides in my experience. There's no center. Um, but I, I would still tend to interpret that as, well, what's happening is you're changing the internal configuration. And so what you're doing is that you're, you're getting rid of the center within your experience, but because part of your experience is representing the outside, that feels like just removing boundaries with your, the inside and the outside. Um, now that, is, that would be kind of like from moment to moment, you know, when they're eating breakfast or you know, walk, you're going for a walk in the woods or something. Um, a special case where I do think maybe there is like an actual breakdown of the boundaries um, is moments of cessation, which is deep in meditation, uh, typically in a retreat, although it depends on the, the practitioner. There are moments in meditation where uh, everything synchronizes and you briefly disappear. And like, it's, it's not kind of like, oh, it all turned dark or like it felt timeless, or it was just very, very, very empty. It's like, no, a complete disappearance, like a hundred percent, like you just did, it seems like you did not exist for a few moments. I would suspect that that is where the field lines actually break open and you do briefly actually become part of the rest of the field. But that's not possible to remember because the field doesn't have you know, neurons, <laughs> it doesn't have like cells to for memories. So <laughs> it's a uh, impossible to remember experience would be my guess. Yeah. If people are curious about that, they can listen to the episode with Delson Armstrong, who enters Naroda Samapati for seven days at a time, which is, <laughs> which is ex that exact complete, like, it's kind of like he's blacking himself out <laughs> for <laughs> six to seven days and waking up in a divine Nirvana state. But, um, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating thing to, to learn about and to hear about. Yes, 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 yes. And, uh, and I think, 
I, I do think, yeah, I mean, those states are very rejuvenating. I mean, like, they, they are mystical, they're described as mystical, but also they're probably very healthy, <laughs> probably very good for you. Yeah, it was, it was interesting to contemplate this idea with him that humans have an, a capacity to hibernate that we have become detached from, that we've forgotten, and perhaps Naroda is, is that right? You don't need food. You don't need all of these things. But, um, you know, there's a rejuvenating longevity aiding capacity when we get into that state. Wow. I'm going to be, I'm going to be extremely shocked in a good way. If it turns out that bears going to Niroda Samapati for, for hibernation. <laughs> maybe bears are not, maybe bear, bears are badass meditators and we just didn't know it. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> What you know, one of the other things I've heard you talk about that I thought was interesting is what happens to the our waves with tension and relaxation and the difference and how that expresses. Yeah. 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 I mean the the cutting edge of kind of our, our models at QRI is the brain as a nonlinear optical computer. And we think that, yeah, muscle tension modulates some of the parameters of this computer. Uh, so let me explain like what I mean by that. So um, the way we think of the brain at QRI these days is, yeah, essentially as like a system that is modulating electromagnetic waves for computation. Um, one way in which you can modulate electromagnetic waves or, in, or light in the, the, you know, the simplest case is uh, using lenses. Uh, and, you know, the way a, a lens works is you're changing the index of refraction um, and you have a particular shape such that like light uh, will um, go through a very particular path. It changes direction, it focuses or it you know, diverges, whatever, depending on the shape of the lens. Um, now imagine that you have sort of like um, some kind of electrical grid in, in space uh, with uh, various kind of like transparent muscles where when you tense the muscles, it, it becomes kind of like a different type of material that, that then it becomes kind of like a different index of refraction. So by tensing the muscles, you can modulate how light moves. That is what we, we think roughly is happening. So when you have like a lot of kind of like muscle tension, as you kind of like move these waves around, they get distorted and they reflect and refract and they cause turbulence and chaos. And it's kind of like an unpleasant, dissonant state. Um, so like, yeah, for example, if you have a lot of muscle tension and then you take a hit of DMT, uh, <laughs> you are going to have a bad time because all of that energy is going to be psh, kind of like bouncing off mm. in these super uncomfortable ways. Now, when you're like really deeply relaxed, all the muscles are relaxed. Then the waves move without distortions or, uh, you know, diffraction, refraction, twisting around. And, uh, and that seems to be like a, a very key um, ingredient or, or factor for kind of like some of the most coherent to beautiful states of mind is that you require kind of like that, that smooth background with very little muscle mm. tension. Um, there is one, one caveat I will say, which is that if the muscle tension is happening in regular symmetrical patterns, then that actually is fine because that can also create a scaffold for, a, for different types of waves that are more energetic but also can be very euphoric. So, so the problem with muscle tension is more kind of irregular muscle tension uh, than like muscle tension itself. Very interesting. Very interesting to hear, you know, just to reflect on this. I, I got out of an ayahuasca experience that was very um, somatically difficult. Yeah. Like lots of just like, you know, kinds of shaking and... Um, pain and the shaman basically said you should just not lift weights for a year um huh. and i and, and i had been and, and just do yoga and really open up your body like open up all of this tension and i had yeah. been you know an athlete that had basically been lifting weights for multiple decades straight um and 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 stopped that and did that and yeah it just was like this might be out of the scope of what you guys study, but it just reminds me of like 
as I really just started to allow my body to naturally re relax and do lots of yoga and, and fascia work, it was just like, man, I could just feel that energy just like coming out of all these little pockets that had been, um, yes, yeah, almost like it was like store, you know, almost kind of like stored. Um, yeah. And I, and I don't know if that's quite the same as like, uh, I, I forget how you put it, but like kind of distorted tension um, versus normal tension. But it was just, yeah, it was super congruent with my direct experience. Yeah. 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 There's a very relevant concept here, um, which is the concept of a geometric frustration, uh, which might explain some of what you were uh, feeling. Mm. So... <clears throat> Um, if you have like, let's say like a square lattice, uh, of a magnetic material, um, and it, you know, each of the atoms in the square lattice, um, can be, let's say like aligned up or down, um, magnetically, there's going to be some, uh, stable configurations of that. You know, let's say like all of the atoms are like perfectly aligned, you know, like, okay, like that minimizes the discrepancy of each atom at, and the ones next door. But if instead what you have is a triangular lattice, um, then you're in trouble because there's no way of, of like positioning each of the magnets in such a way that they're aligned with the neighbors. In other words, the, the shape of the lattice makes it so that you will always be frustrated. There's going to be always like tension. There's going to be regions where like two positive poles are pointing in the same direction where two negative poles and pointing in the same direction. So think about like, yeah, for example, well, so like, yeah, lifting weights in some sense, I suppose like generally if you're not doing more, a more general annealing practice, but yeah, it's something like um, maybe you're pumping out like energy, uh, but you're not doing it uniformly. Right. So, so you may not notice that like your energy channels are actually in a geometrically frustrated state that like, yes, actually there are regions mm -hmm. of your energy body that are like pointing in the same direction. But then on ayahuasca, you pump your system full of energy and all of those little conflicting regions become highlighted because there's just too much energy. It's going to go through all of the paths. And it just turns out some of those paths are actually like in internal conflict with each other. Whereas mm -hmm. yeah, something like, like yoga actually kind of like might minimize that. Like it's, it's all about like, yeah, le making the energy flow regular and smooth and, and directional. So getting rid of those uh, little kinks or like, yeah, geometric frustration over time. So, so we've we've touched on the potential physicalist induced geometric frustration. What about things like suppressed emotions, trauma, um, things like that that seem to show up in the energy body? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, one way of looking at trauma, uh, I think like Mike put it this way at some point. It was something like. Um, your body will essentially tag a whole range of movements, like a whole range of like muscle operations as unsafe. It's like, well, you, you went in a certain situation, you were in certain body configurations and something terrible happened. Your body, your mind will say like, that cluster of configurations leads to bad outcomes. So let me just like torch, you know, air, you know, one mile radius mm. around like any configuration like that. So you just never get in that situation again. Um, the, the thing is like, you know, that on, not only behaviorally prevents you to get into a situation like that again, but also um, prevents you from being able to even think of those situations where like even like, y you know, any muscle movement that is somewhat similar to that situation will be forbidden. And it may turn out that many of those muscle movements are essential for other things too, right? So you may be blocked in many ways, even though, you know, the, your system just wants to block you in a particular way. So, um, uh, and more so, yeah, there's some kind of like, um, uh, thing that, that, uh, that psychedelics do, um, which is in some sense, yeah, kind of, um, uh, relax these, uh, these patterns again, like with, I suspect yeah, process of annealing, you know, like introducing buzzing sensation destroys these, these pre-existing patterns that all of a sudden this whole cluster of movements that were kind of forbidden, uh, become accessible again. Mm. How do you, how do you think about concepts like when, 
one of those experiences gets brought into awareness, it can be healed, thus allowing, you know, greater greater fluidity and capacity for energy to move. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, and there's various ways of, of healing it. Uh, I mean, the one that you just mentioned is, yeah, fairly straightforward. Obviously requires quite a bit of, of skill and practice, which is, yeah, like perceiving it with full mindfulness. Um, I will say there's like, yeah, two kind of like very broad moves that can be uh, really helpful. Um, when confronting, let's say, like a traumatic experience, if it comes up on a psychedelic experience, on MDMA, in the sauna, <laughs> spontaneously. Uh, one is equanimity, and the other one is loving kindness. And I think their mechanism of action is quite different, but they're synergistic and they help each other. So equanimity, uh, at least within the paradigm of Shinzen Young, who wrote the, the Science of Enlightenment, which is a, a great book I recommend, it's uh, the idea of just not resisting, that the idea is that, you know, suffering equals pain times resistance, that you could have a lot of pain, but if you have zero resistance, you know, that, that just feels like a sensation and it's not, it's not, not suffering. Um, uh, so like, yeah, if, if the trauma comes up, the very negative images, the negative emotions come up, if the, if you're able to experience that without resisting, just really feel it, but without like trying to avoid it, um, in my model, what that is doing is that you're, you're training uh, a kind of like stress, you're increasing and training your stress dissipation capacity. I mean, it's kind of you're making your nervous system uh, more capable of dissipating stress uh, over time because you're not getting in the way of, of that stress dissipation. Um, on the other hand, loving kindness is a, quite a different approach. So what you would be doing is generating very positive emotion, like imagining, for example, like a happy dog or like a memory that makes you happy, tuning into that feeling and then imagining that you're, you're gifting that feeling to your traumatic memory. You're kind of like saying, okay, yes, you went through that, but uh, here I am with a lot of love and I'm, I'm you know, here to accept you and, and, and relieve you and heal you. And if you really pay attention to what happens in a process like this, you will notice that really, you know, the loving kindness, what it's doing, it's, it's, it's providing like symmetry and coherence that allows to reorganize the very dissonant patterns from the trauma. Um, and, uh, well, yeah, the dissonant patterns from the trauma are kind of emitting these very harsh, incongruent, chaotic waves. The loving kindness is emitting these very coherent and consonant waves. And if it's dominant uh, during the experience, it will entrain the trauma into a coherent, pleasant state. And then all of a sudden you, you really don't have it anymore. <laughs> um, and, and, and that, that really is also kind of um, the intensity of the loving kindness really matters. Like if, if you can apply like, you know, very high power, high wattage, you know, like 2.3 gigawatts of loving kindness, like that's going to get rid of the trauma, like, you know, 10 times faster. So, so it's very worth kind of like <laughs> trying to get that power up. <laughs> Crank the love, guys. Crank the love. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so these, are, these are essentially kind of theories that you have. I know you're on the kind of cutting edge of things that are happening in the space. Like, are we anywhere close to being able to kind of prove any of this with instruments? I mean, we're working really hard at it and doing a lot of um, psychophysics research, uh, neuroscience research, analyzing, you know, neuroimaging data sets, collaborating with people in academia. Are we close? I mean, I think, I think we so we were starting to have like solid empirical uh, hints, like what I was talking about, like various kinds of coherence with peripheral systems. Uh, we also published um, uh, a write-up, which is about visualizing tactile sensations that provides empirical evidence of essentially this correlation between cons vibrations that are consonant and that being positive valence versus vibrations that are dissonant and that being negative valence. We, we do have some preliminary evidence of that. Um, the data is in that write-up. Um, but we're, yeah, essentially positioning ourselves to be able to generate just so much more high quality research in here. Uh, but a lot of, you know, a lot of our aesthetic is, hey, let's take phenomenology very seriously and like find very large effect sizes so that when we point, you know, the, you know, high powered mainstream neuroscience to it, 
then we're reasonably certain we're going to see something interesting, right? Like that's, that's kind of like what we are, yeah, kind of like focusing mm. on. Like I'm, I'm not that interested in just, well, okay, like this study barely, you know, makes a uh, statistical significant threshold and like it's kind of, I, I want something that is like, no, like a, you know, these super undeniable. high valence state, yeah, undeniable, like your pure harmony and <laughs> pure valence, like something really, really, really strong like that. And uh, and that's what we're working on and figuring out how to get very, very strong, um, undeniable evidence for this. Nice, man. That's amazing. What types of um, kind of like major inflection points in technology do you think would help help advance this in a meaningful way? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, holy grail of technology would be something like uh, EEG plus MEG plus fMRI uh, at the same time, because then then you would be able to see all the electrical signals, all the magnetic state in the surface of, this, of the skull, and also the blood flow inside the brain. And with those three data points, I'm, 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 pre- I'm, not, I'm not pretty sure, but like I, I suspect we can <laughs> triangulate much more. And in particular, things such as uh, the topology of the field, um, which is something that I don't think we can do just with EEG, but combining EEG and MEG, then yes, because you have like the full picture of the electromagnetic field around the skull. And there's a lot of things that can be, yeah, I mean, in, in math, you know, very often, for example, you can tell what kind of not a given, you know, a, a given knot is just by looking at the surface of the knot without looking at the interior. You know, there's like interesting mathematical properties like that. And my s- strong suspicion is that, yes, you, you don't actually need to imag- image the entire brain as long as you have a really high quality s- understanding of what's happening in the surface. You can infer things about the topology of the interior. Mm. Nice. So if, if you're an entrepreneur and you're listening out there, just invent a machine that can do all three of those things simultaneously with these. <laughs> exactly. Yes. <laughs> you know, while we're talking about it, while we're talking about technology, I did think you made a very compelling argument as to whether our current AI will achieve consciousness um, mm-hmm. or why or why it isn't conscious. And I thought that would be maybe kind of an interesting way to round out the show. Yeah, totally. Um, I'm fairly confident that, yeah, current hardware cannot be conscious. Uh, well, trivially, everything is conscious because the universe is a gigantic field of consciousness, but um, there is a difference between uh, what you could call kind of like mind dust, uh, which I think is, yeah, like our computers versus like minds, like actual minds. So the difference between, you know, the brain and a computer is that the brain is actually putting that qualia together into unified experiences that have top-down effects. They have causal, uh, holistic effects. Whereas the computer, it's all 100% bottom-up. Like a GPU is just looking at the local connections. It's not looking at long-range connections. It's not looking at electromagnetic resonance. The field is not feeding back into the low-level operations. And and as such, you know, it's in some sense, yeah, like um, something that doesn't have the capacity for a large-scale pattern to feed back into what is happening at the low level. And, and so like, you know, anything you can point at as like, oh, this is a large scale pattern, it's epiphenomenal. It doesn't have like further causal effects, you know, over and above what you already know. Uh, whereas yeah, things such as electromagnetic resonance, uh, holistic field behavior, that's a very different type of, uh, you know, computational architecture or, or even aesthetic, like way of, of thinking of computation. Um, that said, uh, you know, for better or worse, uh, I do think we will be able to create uh, conscious systems in the future, probably as early as a few decades into the future. And I do worry a lot about that. I mean, like, there's a lot of like ethical things um, that have to be worked out there, such as how to make sure that if we build sentient systems, that they're actually animated by gradients of bliss, or, like that they're like actually happy. Uh, we don't want like a kind of like a super factory farm scenario where we're yeah creating a bunch of sentient <laughs> machines and then enslaving them for our benefit without taking care of them like which would probably happen by default given yeah incentives and our level of philosophical sophistication and empathy and um so yeah we have to act now to prevent that scenario actually that's <laughs> why uh you know we're we're trying to get the word out there about raising consciousness um <laughs> 
Yes. <laughs> so, so, so to just summarize that, just so I understand clearly, like the current, mm-hmm. the current way that these models are built and our computers are configured, it just, they're just not set up for an AI to be truly conscious. Um, it's more like just almost like it's simul it's a simulation of something that appears to be conscious based on it's just a, the, a capacity that is novel and that we're not used to, but it wouldn't be able to kind of feel and reason and come up with kind of like completely adjacent concepts and ideas that it hadn't been exposed to. Is that, am I, am I off? Well, there, I mean, the large language models and the AIs that are going <laughs> to be coming up pretty soon. Um, I do think there will be like, for example, superhuman in creativity. Like they, they will be capable of connecting things that have meaningful relationships that we are missing on. Um, I don't think it is going to be a case where like, well, they're going to be bottleneck on some key capabilities that will make them incompetent or anything of the sort. Um, insentient systems, I think, are can be extremely dangerous. <laughs> I, I am currently in, of the thinking that, yeah, like AI is actually super dangerous, especially very advanced AI. The AI in five, 10 years might be really problematic in some ways. Um, but it doesn't have subjective experience. So there are some things it, it just doesn't know about and can't answer. I mean, like, for example, um, there's really nothing meaningful that Claude 3 Opus or GPT-4 can really tell you about uh, DMT experiences. Um, you know, it, it can kind of like guess, it can make correlations, it can, it can talk about how other people talk about DMT, but, you know, if, if you ask, okay, like if you go to the chrysanthemum level and you do a, a jhana meditation, like what happens? It, it just has no idea, obviously, because <laughs> it just has no access to those states of consciousness. That, that, to some extent, is a little bit of a safeguard. And there is kind of like a very wild possible timeline where the way in which we become smarter than AI is essentially by something like recruiting DMT states of consciousness for hypercomputation. <laughs> it's, you know, it's a very tall order, but, it, but it, it is the sort of thing where like we will continue to have like an advantage over systems. Um, but, you know, things such as like military strategy or uh, diplomacy and things like that, uh, no, AIs will be really powerful, unfortunately. <laughs> mm. Interesting. Well, hopefully we won't need too much military strategy, uh, <laughs> in the future, but I don't know, I'm not, I'm not putting my money on it. Yeah. No, I, yeah. You know, I, I think the future is going to be glorious beyond our imagination. Um, but the next decades and this century will be tricky to nav- navigate. <laughs> mm. Well said. Well, Andres, absolutely love what you're doing, man. Lots of knowledge today. Maybe you could share a little bit more about Qualia if people are interested in following your work. Oh, fantastic. Yes, uh, we publish in uh, QRI.org. Uh, you can find our peer-reviewed papers there as well as our blog posts and videos and essays and um, animation simulations. Uh, I also uh, tweet uh Alge Calypso uh, to, at x.com, I suppose. And um, well, just Google my name and you'll, <laughs> you'll find it. And uh, yeah, I blog at qualicomputing.com. So those are the main main ways you can find more about us. Awesome. Well, I'll make sure to link all those out. And yeah, man, keep up all the great work. It's exciting, exciting to follow. And um, I'm also going to check out some of those meditations and link those as well. Fantastic. Beautiful. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's been uh, delightful. I appreciate the invite. And infinite peace, everybody.